So I just want to introduce um, our wonderful next speaker and my co-host of this event, Dr. Megan Mesher-Cox. Her passion is in helping people to overcome chronic illness to live their happiest and most fulfilling life. Dr. Cox chose to pursue primary care for the opportunity to build long lasting relationships with her patients. She describes her practice as health coaching and thinks of herself as a partner with her patients in their health care. She is especially interested in transitioning our healthcare system from the sick care to the well care model and works with patients to treat health, um, the cause of disease to truly produce health, which prevents, treats, and even reverses some conditions, chronic conditions. She's established the Ventura Walk with a Doc program. Uh, for those of you who have been able to join, it's a lot of fun. A volunteer program to educate the community about health and to join together in a walk. Right now it's online, but hope to, hopefully someday soon we'll be together again. So here you are, Dr. Megan Masher-Cox. Hi, good morning. Can you all see me? Okay. One minute here. Let me take the ball. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday morning. I know you have a lot of places you could be and you're here with us. So, okay, let me start by sharing screen here. just to start and things will be smooth moving forward. So um, if you all have not heard of lifestyle medicine, it's an area of medicine that has hugely grown. Um, it's been around for many, many years. And you'll hear from one of the original lifestyle medicine doctors, um, Dr. David Lowe later today, um, but it's really grown for a number of reasons. Um, my hope today is to share with you the power of lifestyle medicine. Here we go. Okay. So we'll start the morning with some easy questions. So what do we see here? Uh, most people know this is a dolphin and what do dolphins eat? They eat fish. So what would happen if we give a dolphin a diet of jelly beans? The dolphin would get sick, right? And then what would we do? Would we treat them with some pills? Or if the dolphin is sick enough, would we recommend injections? So this is quite a silly example, but this is what we do in modern medicine. So many of the chronic diseases we see today are truly foodborne diseases and they come from our lifestyle and hugely the diet that goes along with our lifestyle nowadays. So these, these dire um, statistics, some of you have probably seen before, but we're living in a time half of all American adults have heart disease. Two thirds of us are overweight or obese and sadly, two thirds of our children show the first signs of heart disease by the time that they're 12 years old. The majority of chronic diseases that we see nowadays, heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high sugars, which we call diabetes, fatty liver, and many of our chronic, our most common cancers, breast cancer, prostate and colon cancer, they're preventable, treatable, and even sometimes reversible with lifestyle change. Up to 80% of our chronic diseases and up to 40% of the cancers we see nowadays. It is a huge number. We have great power over our own health. And the cost of these diseases is immense. Not only does it rob us of years of life, but also greatly reduces the quality of our life and the cost, the dollar cost, over 90% of healthcare spending in the United States is on these chronic diseases, the majority of which could be fully prevented, treated, or reversed. So 
Today, I'm gonna to introduce lifestyle medicine. I describe it to patients as primary care on steroids uh, because lifestyle medicine truly is primary care. Uh, this is the thing. There is nothing that comes even close to the power of lifestyle medicine for treatment of these common chronic diseases. This pyramid is great because it shows the, the true power of lifestyle medicine. Most of us know that it's the core of treatment. It's over 80% of treatment, but we haven't really taken on the true power that it possesses. So usually when we go to a doctor, nowadays a usual doctor visit, unfortunately is quite short. And there's a lot of focus on the symptoms, the medications, and what we would do to treat that one disease. This lifestyle piece, unfortunately, usually gets summed up as a one-liner at the end of make sure you eat well and exercise. But what does that mean? Back to the example of the dolphin, if we give the dolphin a medication, perhaps we could control the condition, but the condition is still present, the disease dis-ease. So there's some dis-ease within the body and there's still this large problem. If left unaddressed, it'll fester and lead to further disease. Uh, please know on this, the 80% lifestyle at the bottom, that supplements belong in the area with medications. They are not part of the true baseline health. Supplements are to be used similar to pharmaceutical medications when needed. And you'll hear more about that later today from other speakers. So what we would do, what I would see uh, previous before I found lifestyle medicine and shifted my practice style, we'd see someone that comes in, unfortunately, dealing with a disease, talk about what's going on and see what the next treatment is going to be, the next step in management for that patient. And quite commonly, that would be a pill, an injection, or sometimes a procedure or management of that chronic disease. And I'd see the person back some weeks, months, or even over a year later, and inevitably they would have worsened. And it led me to believe, what am, what am I doing here? It's not truly producing health for people. I am leading them on their journey through this disease process. And unfortunately, get, the person is getting sicker all the way along the way. This is the path of traditional medicine nowadays and part of the reason for the huge um, increase in lifestyle medicine. So what is lifestyle medicine? Lifestyle medicine focuses on six key areas to improve health. And anyone who's seen me in the office uh, will go through these, usually at the new patient appointment, uh, physical and quite commonly in between as well. So these areas, we talk about nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress, and support system. The sixth area is avoidance of risky substances in the tobacco and alcohol, and quite commonly that will be lumped in with nutrition. So it's what's going into the body, how we're moving the body, how we're resting the body, and what's going in via the mind with stress and support. And again, this makes up 80% of our health or this ease. So why all of the excitement, right? Most people know what health looks like. So regular exercise, restful sleep, nice loving relationships, but the nutrition piece, even if people have the best of intentions, there's so much information out there that it's hard to cut through and see what the true science is. So the majority of today you'll notice is focused on the nutrition piece. This slide, uh, this shows the um, intake of calories for the average American. 63% of calories that we get are from processed food another 25% from animal foods. So these two together, very low or devoid of fiber and other nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. And on average, only 12% of what goes into our bodies is from plant food, of which half is processed plant food itself. 
um, for instance, almonds that are found in a candy bar. So only 6% of what goes into the average American body is truly whole plant foods. It's full of the fiber, nutrients, minerals, vitamins, the items that produce health. And surprisingly, three quarters of Americans think that they have a good diet. They write their diet as good or great, very good, very good, or excellent. So three quarters of us think we have a great diet even after seeing that slide of the actual diet in the average American. So if we're saying we don't wanna eat that way to produce health, then how do we eat, right? So a whole foods plant-based diet is what's recommended. And you'll see in some future slides, it does not have to be 100% to be healthful. Everywhere we can go along the way produces more health. So what do we mean by whole foods plant-based? The majority of what's going into our body being from the ground. So vegetables, beans and lentils, whole grains, fruits, nuts and seeds, and avocados. And then very rarely or sparingly having the foods that are low in nutrients, but high in calories. So that being animal products, meats, that's red meat, chicken, and fish, um, oils, which are very calorie, de calorie dense, excuse me, with no fiber, um, and the commercially raised meats and processed foods. This slide, this comes from the Adventist health studies. And I love going over this because it shows the true power of every of small steps. So let me orient you to the slide, please. So on the left side of the screen, you'll see in green, um, this is the vegan diet. So vegan is a little different than whole foods plant-based. Um, again, we'll go over that later, but vegan diet or no animal products whatsoever. On the right side of the slide in red, you'll see the standard American diet. And then the steps along the way, you'll see standard American, that's the highest levels on that right side. The next step is semi-vegetarian. And then there's pesco vegetarian, lacto ovo, and then um, full vegan. So this, this graph on the top, what you're looking at is the average weight. So this study was done on over 70,000 people. And it was actually uh, the population of people were Adventists. So even the most unhealthful Adventists are typically more healthy than the average American uh, because of the other factors of health. Uh, which we won't get into today. Um, but again, the, the true comparison between these. On average, there is a 30 pound difference in those on the vegan diet and those on the standard American diet. And down below here, we see two of the most common conditions today, high cholesterol or cholesterol in general and blood pressure. And same thing, you see the stepwise approach. So if someone's on the standard American diet, they don't want to be full plant-based, but they wanna take small steps in the direction, we can see there's health benefits each step along the way. And please, I alluded to it, but please, what we don't want, if we really wanna to get to true health, um, we're not wanting to trade a handful of pharmaceutical medications for a handful of supplements. Health does not come in a bottle. It does not come in pill form, tablet form, protein powders. We're talking true health from the food we eat and from how we move and live in our bodies. So once again, please don't forget, we do know what health looks like. Um, to make a comment here about exercise and sleep. Um, exercise. There have been so many studies done on exercise. And what we know is that every step along the way in the disease process, um, for instance, a really great study that was done with breast cancer or studies, uh, if someone does not have breast cancer, if they regularly exercise, their chance of having breast cancer goes down, is lower. If they have breast cancer, and they're regularly exercising. Their chance of getting over it and into remission is higher. And if someone has already gone through treatment, the chance of having breast cancer come back is lower. 
It helps every step along the way in the health journey. There's nothing else in medicine that has the power to help all along the way like this. Sleep, especially in the days of coronavirus and what we're living through right now, um, I wanted to know about sleep. So on average, what's recommended is seven to nine hours a night. Um, so split the difference, so it was eight hours. The first half of that, the first four hours is when the body can really heal. Your body is either is in one of two states. It's either in fight or flight, or it's in rest and repair. So the first half of sleep, your body is getting the rest and repairing that it needs. The second half of the night is when the brain truly heals. That's where we can lay down memory. That's where we can, if we're having a problem remembering things or dealing with any anxiety or depression, quite often it's because our mind is not getting the rest that it needs, which is that full eight hours, seven to nine. There comes a point when we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And that's why we're here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm looking forward to the next speakers. I hope you all are too. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. One more slide, an invitation for walk with a doc. So you'll hear it at the end, um, but please, many of us uh, doctors, especially those that you'll see today and many others across the world have noted, we need to do something more. That's the premise of walk with a doc. Instead of saying, okay, go exercise. It says, come exercise with me. We're there. We're here to help however we can. Okay. So I'll look, um, I, so question, can we share the information for Walk With a Doc on Zoom? Absolutely, we'll put it into the, um, the chat bar. And I'll turn the ball. Jay was gonna go through some questions that we've gotten. Um, hi there, yes, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A or the chat and I will um, do my best to get as many to Dr. Cox as she can answer in the time we have available. All right. All right, bear with me just a moment. And I'll say, I, you know, I didn't elaborate on the exercise piece. While we have a minute here, I'll elaborate on it. Um, as far as exercise goes, we know the more the better, the recommendation being at least 30 minutes, five times a week, um, very minimum. Um, ideal would be an hour, um, at least five times a week or more. Um, but the other piece of it is the sedentary behavior. So sedentary behavior itself is a risk factor for chronic disease separate, even if we're exercising the half hour, hour a day, um, being sedentary during the day is really unhelpful. So at least five minutes an hour to get up and move around. So please take the time and do that. We wanted to squeeze everything in today, um, but we don't want to um, promote unhelpful behavior here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, we just have a comment, if I could share, um, from one of our, our participants. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, she says, thank you, Dr. Mesher Cox. This is how I live my life precisely in order to prevent illness. And at 60, I can assure you that it worked great. And I, of course, feel amazing. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I wonder if you could, um, you had touched a little bit on the, the difference between um, healthcare and sick care. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit more for us? Yeah, so um, that's a really great question. So the, the model of healthcare that we are living in today, or I should say a decade ago, because it's already started to switch, um, is the model where the more care that people need, um, the more money is made by the healthcare system. Um, and although we want to produce care, the way the system gets compensated is by people being sick. So it's the sick care model in the sense that the whole, what's keeping the system going is sickness. 
that's switching really a total 180. So what is um, in the works, if things keep going this direction, is really switching over to a healthcare model. Um, there's a big problem right now, you all might have heard with physician burnout. Um, and a lot of it is for this reason, right? People went into medicine because they really truly want to help people, but they're rubbing up against this issue of, well, how do I make ends meet if I'm helping people that takes a lot longer to really produce health one financially two we just don't have the education on it unless we've gone out off on our own into like what i've considered med school 2.0 of truly learning how to keep people healthy so um i'll suffice but I'll, I'll wrap up here but a couple of things one medical schools today are very different than how they were a decade or two decades or four decades ago now you'll see pictures of med students in teaching kitchens learning how to cook so that we can teach our patients how to be healthy and secondly the the change in the healthcare models um, where healthcare systems and physicians will be compensated on people staying and being healthy. So again, that's more in the future, um, but many of us are looking forward to it. There's a couple of, of pretty important ones. I, I do have time to do one or two more. For sure. Dr. Megan? Yes. Okay. So um, we have a question about um, B vitamins. How do you get your B, B vitamins? That's a great question. So I didn't talk on that. Um, so, and I know we'll go over it later in the day, but the B vitamins are all water soluble and, and found in our plants. The one exception is vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 is made by bacteria that live in the soil. Um, it's in the stomach of certain animals and when those animals and found in the soil, when those animals have um, bowel movements, that soil has those um, bacteria in it. It goes to the soil and we have more and more bacteria in the soil. Okay, so a couple of things. One is we're very sanitary nowadays. People don't usually grow food and then pull out a carrot with dirt on it and chew on that carrot and get some dirt with it. Problem number one. Problem number two is unfortunately our soil is, is doesn't have the health that it used to be. Uh, if you see healthy soil, it's almost black and it sticks together. It's very healthful. Um, most of our soil nowadays looks more like dirt. Um, and so it doesn't have all those helpful ingredients. And unfortunately we're seeing the results of that. So if someone eats animal products, they do not have as much of a risk of B12 deficiency, although we see it a lot now too, uh, because what happens is those cows, when they eat grass, they're getting some of the dirt and soil with that, um, with their grass and it gets into their body. They have B12 that is in their muscles. If you eat the muscle of the cow, you're getting B12. So you're getting it from the middleman. So nowadays, luckily we can supplement. We don't see the B12 deficiencies across the board. Plus they do supplement livestock as well. Yes, yes, actually that's um, a great so, Yeah, that's, that's a big one. Two, two more quick ones, hopefully we can get through them quickly. I know we, we're on a little time crunch here. So why is sitting so bad? Um, that's a good question. So our, our blood flow does a lot of things, but one of the great things it does is that when, as, blood flow, as blood flows through our body, it takes oxygen down to our muscles um, in our cells. And it also takes the toxins that are there back up so that you could get them out and breathe them out or somehow get them out of your body. So one, we're not getting that natural mechanism of clearing out the body. Uh, so the body cannot be in the rest and repair as well, um, as well as it would be otherwise. Um, second, uh, the heart is a muscle, so it needs to work. So even if we're moving around a little bit, getting that extra blood flow, getting the heart pumping on a regular basis, um, that the more we use the muscle, the better it is. Um, and then lymphatics as well, but we won't get into that today. It's similar to okay. the one more quick one, one more quick one. So um, this person asks, I know it's difficult to see your patients as much as they need time-wise. You don't have enough time to really explain all this nutrition aspect. Do you use health coaches to give your patients one-on-one -on -one support? <laughs> That's a great question. So yes, absolutely. Um, and it was a big motivator, a big motivating factor for today, right? How do we actually get people the information they need? So um, I use Jay all the time. Um, you'll hear from her later and she's um, very 
on um, evidence-based. And that's one of the biggest pieces that we need things to be evidence-based by the science. So yes, absolutely, we use health coaches. Well, thank you so, so much. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, you, there were so many comments and questions. People really, really enjoyed it. I wish we could get to them all. Um, so just thank you so, so much for that presentation. So informative, such good stuff. Things, action steps we can actually start taking right now. So we appreciate you so much. Thank you, Dr. Megan Mesher-Cox.